Well, welcome back everybody. Frank LaQuinta is head of digital data and operations for Edward Jones, the financial services firm known both as a Fortune 500 powerhouse and one of the world's most admired companies. With 19,000 financial advisors serving more than 8 million clients, they have 1.9 trillion, that is with a T, in client assets under their care. Frank has responsibility for the firm's overall technology, digital and data leadership, vision and strategy with a focus on transforming the foundation of the firm. One of the things I most admire about Frank is his laser focus on delivering extraordinary experiences to Edward Jones's branch teams and their clients. And after a 30 year career on Wall Street uh, in technology, Frank came to Edward Jones in 2016 and was as assumed the role of Chief Information Officer in 2018. Recently, uh, he took on additional responsibilities, which we will unpack here in a few minutes, but let's start at the beginning. I want to welcome you, Frank, uh, thanks, to the Matt. podcast, and thanks for welcoming me to this beautiful facility of yours. Yes, welcome to Edward Jones. Beautiful, amazing, amazing. Well, take us back five years. Um, you made a big commitment, you made a five-year plan, which is pretty bold given how fast things change. So maybe share the vision, maybe share the pillars of that plan. Yeah, well, thanks, Dan. And I really appreciate the opportunity to tell our Edward Jones story. Um, one of the reasons that the Edward Jones opportunity was so appealing to me when, when I took the role was the firm was looking for an outside-in perspective on our way forward. Uh, really asking what we needed to do to future proof our firm and actually and strive to be one of the the best uh, financial services firms in North America. And I had led many transformations in the past and, and lived to tell about it. Uh, uh, but I really felt that the ambition of the firm matched well with my experience. So the approach that I took really my first step was to be, be very thoughtful, uh, continue to learn the firm and most importantly, not show up with the answers. Um, and I took inspiration from one of our previous managing partners, John Bachman, who in 1997 was actually leading the growth and transformation of the partnership, uh, bringing Wall Street to Main Street. Um, and at the time, he implored the firm to use technology, you know, to help propel our growth and scale and, and, and said, while our focus always should be on the branch team enablement and exceptional client experiences, his quote was perfect. He said, the war in financial services will not be won because of technology, but it will be lost without it. And so I tried to emulate that rally cry. And uh, over the Christmas holiday in 2018, I wrote a white paper called uh, Changing the Business of Technology, the Imperative for Vertical Transformation. And I was very intentional about using the word business and the word vertical, because in order to transform, we had to, to change the way that we led technology, and, and how we ran the business of technology end to end and top to bottom, you know, and that's the reason why I talked about vertical transformation with strategic intent. And by making these massive changes, uh, we could help further enable our business to grow and scale and meet those outsized ambitions. Um, but the idea behind it was that we were at an inflection point where in order to future proof the firm, uh, we really needed to be bold. We needed to be decisive around what we needed to do to continue to compete and excel. Uh, and at the time when I was writing the narrative, I placed the emphasis on uh, the disruption, the innovation and the life enriching technology advances that we had seen at the time. You know, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Apple, Google, even gamification and how all of those experiences single handedly changed our lives and more importantly, how it changed our expectations. And so the challenge that was in front of us was, you know, how do we exceed client and branch team expectations? And the answer became very obvious, right? It was we needed to change everything, right? We needed to modernize and simplify everything we did in order to create the conditions for success for our firm. Um, and so I sort of took a step back and said, you know, how do we rally the firm? So in order to rally the firm, we first needed to talk about our why. What was the why behind all of this? Then the how, and then most importantly, how did the associates see themselves in this opportunity? How could they be part of this transformation? And, and I know that not everybody loves change, but for me, the, the whys were indisputable, right? Expectations are higher. Uh, if you think about the way that we live today, consumers have uh, access to advanced technology features that you'd say were unimaginable a few years ago, but now are the expectation. Um, technology literacy, right? It's increased. Uh, the, the, the user community has matured to the point where we actually have to partner for innovation, right? Technologists no longer own the mar market on technology or innovation. Um, leveraging data. Uh, I'd say data is the most underutilized asset in many firms. 
uh, and we needed to use it to create that actionable insight for, for our financial advisors and clients. Uh, and we were really thinking about that well, well in advance of a, AI, AI becoming mainstream uh, as it did last year. Um, but also competition was fierce, right? We saw the advent of new technologies, the commodi commoditization of infrastructure, uh, and in, that enabled companies to kind of become increasingly nimble and seize opportunities, and also really lowered the barriers to entry for markets. But also many firms were trying to do the exact same thing that we were doing. So we needed to really move with conviction and speed. Uh, also, of course, talent was critical, right? Being able to upskill, retain, attract technology talent, uh, in order to maintain our competitive advantage. And we really feel like our people uh, and the currency of trust is always gonna be Edward Jones' strategic advantage. Uh, we had to modernize to reduce risk, especially when it came to cyber. And then I really felt strongly that technology should elicit this mo emotional response, right? You know what good technology looks like. Uh, so quality software, user experience, that emotive design all become essential value drivers uh, that really aligned to uh, and, and, and help us deliver that ideal Edward Jones client experience. And, and of course, all, through all this, as every technologist knows, the focus has got to be on stability, security, and scale being the number one priority. Uh, so we pulled all this together, uh, pulled together a plan, pulled together an investment thesis, and that really centered around uh, cloud and mobile first, the quality software design and architecture, uh, DevOps and continuous improvement, what kind of collaboration tools we were gonna use, uh, and then build versus buy. So how do we engage third parties versus building everything ourselves? Um, we also had to revamp the connectivity between our, our branch, branches and home office, uh, and also really move more towards an agile shop that was led by our digital product management teams. Uh, and ultimately, we just had to make sure that we had the technology and the talent that would serve as the foundation for the future of our firm, to find our objectives, we defined our measures, uh, what were those key results that we were striving for? And then we, we told our story. We told our story inside the firm, outside the firm, um, and articulated that strategy in both words and, and actions. And that led us really to where we are today, which is that you know our unwavering commitment and, and our, to, to delivery and execution and adoption. And, and this has us ready to realize our purpose of partnering for positive impact so we can make a, a difference in the lives of our clients, colleagues, and the communities that we serve. That's a mic drop moment right there. That's like, I've got four podcasts that I want to do with you now, uh, Frank. This is, this is great. Thanks. You know, one of the words you mentioned there that really resonates with me is uh, in, intentional. You know, you were intentional. I think that's really one of the things that differentiates the best in our business. The fact that you put that vision down on paper, I'm sure your wife was not pleased of yeah, that Christmas break, but, right. <laughs> but how that really forces us to, to think through the messaging and yeah. the real story yeah. there. So that was five years ago, great vision, great strategy. Let's fast forward, big moment of truth. Uh, last November, a couple months ago was that five-year mark. So proof in the pudding, how'd it go? Uh, wh where do we stand today? Yeah, so, so Dan, I, I think I've told you in the past, I'm all about promises made and promise, promises kept, right? I think because it really builds that currency of trust, not only with the you know, technology associates, but the, the wider firm. But I also say uh, uh, that our success wasn't wasn't accidental, but it also wasn't inevitable, right? Um, and it really took the dedication, commitment, and the heart and soul of every associate within digital, uh, but also our stakeholders who were, I'd say, very supportive. Uh, they challenged us with big ideas, they pushed us, but they also showed us grace when not every day went as planned, right? So. Um, the stakes were high, uh, but so was the reward. And, and most importantly, you know, I've learned this along the way to celebrate wins together as a firm. Um, through all the, the, the transformations, it, you know, you have to take a step back. You want to enjoy the ride. You want to celebrate small and big wins. And also, you can never say thank you enough to all the associates who uh, made the sacrifices to help us achieve, uh, achieve success. Um, the other thing to note is we did all of this through the pandemic. Uh, and to be quite honest, you know, we didn't miss, miss a beat. And it actually accelerated our change jersey, you know, uh, journey. And and you know, as they say, you know, like never waste a crisis. Uh, so we really hunkered down and made crisp decisions on some of our tooling. Um, we prioritized the work that would would allow our home office associates to be most productive as possible. Uh, and then we also focused on what kind of capabilities and tools our branch teams needed to work and continue to connect with our clients, such as you know, virtualization and and self service mobile tools and. Microsoft O365 and Zoom, and then how to keep our home office fully connected in support of our branch teams. 
Uh, and during that time, uh, we actually had stellar firm portfolio execution because our firm itself was transforming in lockstep with the digital transformation. Uh, you know, just recently we enabled the, one of the largest rollouts of Money Guide Elite in the industry to all 19,000 financial advisors. And that actually would become the basis for our future, uh, future financial planning signature experience. Uh, we also started the rollout of a new Salesforce branch desktop uh, that'll conclude this year, but that'll go out to all 40,000 branch team members. So it's been an amazing journey so far, uh, but we're not nearly finished. Um, you know, our goal is to both raise the floor and the ceiling to continue to deliver those extraordinary experiences you mentioned to our clients, to our branch teams uh, and associates. And we're actually really well positioned to do that. Uh, so much so that the original vertical transformation, uh, you know, vision has now transitioned to our next five-year digital roadmap, complete with a 2030 vision, but it's essentially the modernization now of the enterprise function. So if you think about compliance, operation, uh, operations, branch development, uh, branch operations and human capital, all will be leveraging the work that we've done over the last five years to build net new capabilities. Um, and it really becomes the next step in that digital transformation, which is less about the technology and it's more about adopting and applying and maximizing all this change to lead us in, into the future. Uh, and it really becomes more about the mindset and the skill set so that financial advisors can reinvent, reinvent their practices uh, and serve our clients to meet and exceed their ever evolving expectations. Yeah, that's. Um... That's why I titled this podcast, Promises Made, Promises Kept. I think that's really powerful. And, and uh, you know, with that, you talked about getting grace. When we stub our toe, you, uh, I know trust and credibility come with that. And uh, opportunity to take on more. So me, I mentioned in the introduction that you've been given expanded responsibility. So what does that look like today, Frank? Yeah, Dan, you know, I, I'm, I'm honored, honored and, and humbled to, to uh, in addition to my digital responsibilities, the firm asked me to lead operations and our data and AI efforts, which we coined knowledge powered. Um, and to me, it's just a natural extension of our digital strategy and, and the next logical leg of our, our digital journey. Uh, and our operations team is, is crafting their, their own transformation narrative, uh, which is really about how our ops teams become more efficient and effective in supporting our branch teams. And we're already well on our way to, to doing that. Um, we're transforming asset movement. Uh, we just rolled out a new fixed income trading system and we have plans to, to create a modernized digital client onboarding experience. And we'll be taking a look at all the operations capabilities end to end, just like we did with digital uh, and really partnering with the operations team uh, to, to uh, both deliver a, a, a fantastic experience for the operations associates, but also for our uh, branch teams and, and clients. Uh, with re regards to uh, data and AI, as I mentioned before, we were already trying to maximize the impi uh, impact of our data and the insight it could provide in the first leg of the journey, right? But, but AI is actually the epitome of gradually suddenly, right? It's all, all of a sudden, it's, you know, 18 months ago, it was an interesting topic. Uh, and now today, if you don't have plans to elevate your experience that you deliver via AI, you're way behind. Um, so we have a maniacal focus on um, how we can maximize the combination of advisor intelligence supported by artificial intelligence and, uh, and the availability of this kind of information at, at the click of a button. So, you know, our goal is to have AI and technology help advisors become more efficient with their time and help them serve their clients even better in a very hyper-personalized way. Um, and AI, as everybody knows, can make many of the day-to-day -day tasks much quicker uh, and therefore freeing up financial advisors uh, and client support team members time to focus more on the human side of their work. So it is super exciting and has our competitive juices flowing. You know, I mentioned you're um, one of the most admired companies out there. You also have one of the most admired managing partners. Uh, you, you and I talk a lot. You talk about your CEO, Penny Pennington, a lot. Um, you refer to her as the leadership light at the top. So talk about Penny. Yeah, so, so Penny has always been a champion of, of the firm transformation as well as our digital transformation. And uh, Penny is someone who pushes you to be a better professional, but most important, a better human being, right? So, uh, but, but she's got that humble swagger and, and it's really taken our firm to the next level. Uh, and she really makes it a point to encourage all leaders and associates, no matter your role, stand up and be counted, bring your whole self to work each day, uh, ensure our place, uh, our firm is a place of belonging uh, and that everyone gets the opportunity to be a contributor to a championship team. So it's, a, it's an honor for me to be part of her leadership team. 
Yeah, I just read something by Penny recently. She posted, I think it was on LinkedIn. It was uh, talking about two big ideas for 2024. And the first was being all about AI. You've talked about that. Um, she was very articulate in, in her vision about um, marrying AI with another form of AI. You've talked about the advisor intelligence. Uh, well, I think it's brilliant. So knowing that you own AI now as a function, I'd love to hear more about what this means for your business, how it impacts productivity, uh, how it's going to help your advisors serve clients better, you know, and help Edward Jones win. Yeah, you know, that, and that's the differentiator we're striving for, to, to marry that advisor intelligence and the artificial intelligence to create what we call a knowledge power organization in service to our clients. Uh, and that that mindset actually propels this forward, you know, because the advisors actually have a really strong and positive view on AI because they know it will create greater capacity and help them run their branch and serve their clients better than ever before. Uh, but they also have high expectations that AI will help create better support opportunities and better efficiencies within the home office functions that will actually compound all those benefits. Um, and that compounding effect is really overall just des designed to create a better client experience and help advisors enhance their business and, and, and run their practice. Um, and AI isn't just coming, right? It's already here. Uh, in fact, you know, at Edward Jones, we've been using AI for many years to serve clients. Uh, for example, uh, we're using it today to help potential clients find an Edward Jones financial advisor that, uh, you know, ideally fits their, their needs. Uh, we have an online tool called Edward Jones Match. Uh, it's a, a quick quiz that, you know, once you take it, it provides uh, potential clients with a personalized list of financial advisors based upon a series of factors like uh, investing goals, preferences, life stage, and of course, location. Uh, and, and the AI tool, it, it helps parse the vast amount of information the, in the back end um, and provides personalized suggestions on financial advisors that may be a good fit, but it also helps create a strong impression uh, with interested investors because if they elect to set up a meeting, our financial advisors will know who they're going to talk to. And it, you know, is this someone that we can serve well and deeply? Uh, so so we've, we've been using it across the, the board. Um, we've also been using it as a learning tool that helps uh, identify factors that indicate whether older adult clients may be at risk for, for exploitation. Uh, and this allows us to better protect, serve, and educate our clients. So Dan, as you know, everywhere, it's just a super exciting space. And we're really just uh, scratching the surface on the impact that we seek, seek to make. Um, you mentioned her LinkedIn article, right? So she had those two big ideas. The second big idea for 2024 is the great wealth transfer, right? Which has just a huge tech component to it. Uh, and we all have a front row seat to this, right? You, you, you have kids, I have kids, right? We have millennials, Gen Y, Gen Z, uh, and our families and my wife have five boys. So we see this, uh, you know, every day. Penny talked about $84 trillion will pass to the next generation in the next 20 years. Uh, so we need to be able to serve all generations and meet them where they're at. And, you know, the younger generations grew up in the digital world. So their expectations are they have access to everything that they need whenever they need it 24-7, right? Uh, so in response to that, we've continuously enhanced our mobile capabilities for advisors, for clients, and even our home office associate, uh, associates. And that digital experience actually helps augment and enhance the trusted relationship our advisors have with our clients. Uh, and even though, you know, the, that younger generation are, are digital natives, our, our actual Jones research uh, has found that 66% of 18 to 34 year olds prefer an in-person interaction with a financial advisor because they, they emphasize the need for deep personal relationships to prioritize their unique financial goals and, and challenges of being a young investor. So we have to be ready for both, but, you know, life is complicated, but our advisors and our technology help turn that complication into uh, an opportunity every day. You know, all this resonates on all levels and on the client level, especially. And, you know, Frank, one of the fun things we do on this podcast are the mystery questioners. And we're able to identify four incredible people who know you well, uh, are gonna help me unpack those things that make Frank a special leader. So these are folks who know those superpowers that allow you to deliver on the big, on the big bold promises you've been talking about. So. Let's listen into the first one and we come back, tell us who this is, and then we'll have some fun with their question. So Frank, I know you're a person with tremendous vision who's driven change in every role you've had. If you could share one insight or lessons learned from your experience driving transformational change as a leader, what would that be? And how would you say that insight shaped your approach to future initiatives? 
So I think that question was from Bob Ansamo, if I uh, hear Indeed. Hear Bob well. So Bob's been with me through thick and thin. I'm, I'm really excited that uh, he's brought his, his talent, his leadership and experience to Edward Jones. Um, but in, in terms of insight uh, into his question, uh, you know, my view is there's always three camps or mindsets in every transformation. You know, mindset number one is fully bought in. Thank God you are here, Frank. We've been talking about this for years. Uh, we're excited to be part of this. Let's go, right? Boom, check. Those folks are ready to lead, ready to learn, ready to take chances and risks, and, and, and to be quite honest, change the world. Um, mindset number two, those who immediately opt out. They want no part of the change for whatever reason, whether they're comfortable in their career, uh, they don't want to learn anything new, they don't want to change. I say even more on the empathetic side, Maybe they're afraid to be vulnerable and say that they may not be up to the task of leading and participating in, in the hard change work ahead. Uh, in either case, though, you really can't let this mindset be a derailleur, right? The best that you can hope for here is to kind of neutralize any negativity and, and quiet quitting. Um, but the key is around mindset number three, right? It's, I call it the magic middle. And, and they're the absolute key to the success of any transformation. Um, they, ha they may have the will, but not the skill. Uh, they actually may be afraid to choose sides, right? And they wanna wait to see whether the change leadership or the status quo is gonna prevail. Um, but you know, in leading a transformation, you know, time and momentum are critical success factors. Uh, and that's where you as a leader need to take that message directly to that group, um, help them see the opportunity, help them see the role that they can play while making sure that they know what it's gonna to take to be a, a, a part of something bigger than themselves. Um, and this is where you have to actually enlist support of mindset number one. Uh, you have to have these champions of change help show the way. And you know, if you're successful there, um, it's that moment where that magic middle starts to move towards that mindset number one, and you start to create that momentum and, and trust and, and you get deeper alignment and that opportunity actually propels the organization forward. But that's when you gotta go back to that mindset number two again and kind of take their pulse because it may start to feel a little lonely and more risky to be in part of that naysayer camp. Um, but, you know, and, and on the other side, it's like those who thought it might be easier to opt out may feel now compelled to say shift left and become part of that, that future. But, uh, make no mistake, getting the majority of folks into a change mindset is hard work. Uh, it takes leadership, it takes listening, uh, it takes grace. Uh, I mentioned small wins along the way, right? Uh, and also you can't let missteps derail you, right? The change is hard and uh, you can't let those missteps sort of reinforce the naysayers mindset. So, um, you know, when, when I think about leading the change jersey, uh, journey, um, you just have to be more committed to anybody uh, than anybody else. You have to have uh, this unwavering thought around the outcomes you're seeking. You always have to explain your why. Uh, you have to be part leader, but also kind of you know part shoulder to lean on when when times get tough. Uh, but the reward of trans transforming those three camps into a single base camp uh, really enables you to build that foundation for uh, for the future. And I take that mindset along with I'd say really important transparency and authenticity into every transformation that I lead, and it's really served the work and our success well. You know, words matter with these things, being that committed leader, like you talked about, even just calling that group three, the magic middle. Most people call them the frozen middle, right? Whole different connotation yeah, yeah. when you think That's about right. them in those They're different ways. Yeah, yeah, so great question, uh, Bob. And I actually, uh, but because the two of you go so far back, he shared a lot of stories with me, Frank. So uh, one of them involved an outage during your days on Wall Street, uh, which was a pretty big deal. People were not happy. Um, he referenced a legend named Tom, I won't mention the last name, who came downstairs with a baseball bat. You know, if, I wonder if you remember that episode. Uh, I do. Uh, <laughs> I'd say it was definitely a uh, life, life changing lesson, if you will. Uh, let's just say he, he ran trading back in the day and uh, we're having a situation that generated a, a trading error, but it actually generated a, a pretty large profit. And he got really mad. And at first I didn't quite get it. I'm like, you know, it, it generated a profit. Uh, and then he just looked at me and he said, and rightfully so, you know, I might add, he, I would have rather have been a loss so that we would feel the pain enough so that we could, it would lead to positive change than everybody feeling relieved and complacent. And I, and I was like, oh, I miss that. You know, so that's really, it really just shaped how I think about risk and accountability. And you have to do the work to protect the franchise and you have to, you know, own issues that arise and learn from the mistakes so you can get better. 
I'd also say the image of the baseball bat didn't hurt with that motivation either. So, yes, I do remember that. That's good stuff. Great stories. Uh, you know, I think about your answer, how you've been leading this change journey, the five-year journey. I think this next mystery question will kind of unpack maybe how, how you do that. What is it about Frank that allows you to do that? So let's listen to this question number two. So Frank, I'm curious where you get your tenacious resilience and perseverance during setbacks or significant challenges and always continuing to push the boundaries. All right, so that sounds like Kevin Adams, right? So uh, Kevin is just, uh, he's a complete leader. Uh, he's an amazing technologist. Uh, I'd even say he's a financial services savant. So. Uh, you know, he's definitely someone who keeps everyone honest and, and pulls out uh, the best in them. But, um, you know, I love the question because for me personally, I've always been an overachiever and I always felt I needed to work harder than everyone else. Um, but, you know, I reached an inflection point in my career about 20 years ago where all the work that I had put in really started to benefit me and my career uh, and those I served. Um, and I went from sort of overachieving to having this confidence that although remaining humble about that, uh, but really having the attitude of, I got this, no matter the size of the problem. And uh, because of that experience, uh, I've always been calm under fire. Uh, and Edward Jones, we actually say calm on the mic, right? Uh, because it's extremely important uh, that I take a measured approach and my uh, inflection is all, always equally measured so that when others may be stressing about a given situation, uh, I can be that calming influence so that we can actually focus on getting the issue resolved. Um, in fact, for me, when, when under pressure, the, the world kind of slows down and, I, and I'm always thinking about what the right thing to do is given the situation. So I think that that calm confidence has, has really served me well. Uh, it makes people want to listen, to follow, uh, to help, and also to be, be part of something you know, bigger than themselves. And I'd, I'd add, you know, after about 30, 40 years of leading these technology efforts, I, I'm still driven. I want to do great things and I, I want to be challenged by big problems that are hard to solve. You know, because if they, all these problems are easy, I think anybody could do it. But, um, you know, I, I really like to think big. I like to start small, scale quickly, and definitely push the boundaries. Um, and some days you just need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And uh, because that really leads to that personal growth and amazing breakthroughs. Um, I'd also say it's really okay to make mistakes. And if you're not making mistakes, you're not being challenged and you're not learning uh, and you're actually not making progress. So once you get the f past that fear of making a mistake, you bounce back quickly, you take those lessons learned um, and make a rim, bigger impact next time. Uh, and I say, you know, lastly, most of all, I, I love to play to win. And I, and I feel strongly that we, we, the work that we get to do together, it's done well. We all win, right? The firm wins, our, our colleagues, and most importantly, our clients. Well, that comes true and uh, everybody likes to be on the winning team. And, and uh, so thank you, Kevin, for helping us with that question. Kevin had some great stories too, but we'll save those for another, another day. Don't get and, me trouble. <laughs> uh, we have a couple more mystery questions coming up here. But first, um, I like to dig into the Frankisms, those expressions that help us understand your leadership thinking, your leadership style, you know, how you approach these big, these big bold problems. And so uh, maybe talk about the first one, which is, you talk about we have the opportunity to lead or to commiserate. So let's talk about that. Yeah, you know, uh, sometimes I'm like a broker record with some of the things I say, uh, you know, but, uh, but in every difficult situ situation, especially when you're leading change, I feel as a leader, you have to be all in, right? You need to cast your leadership light so that others know how to follow, uh, they know how to contribute, and then they can create those leadership moments for, for themselves. I, I also really feel that you're in control of the way you show up. You know, are you positive? Are you bringing energy? Are you taking the hill, right? And, and how's your body language? You know, are you listening to people? Are you looking to help others? Uh, and the easy way out when you're dealing with change is to commiserate versus lead, right? And I choose to lead. You know, are these things hard? Yes, they are. But if it was easy, anybody could do it. Um, and if you show a crack and leave that opening, that starts to slow things down and it creates uncertainty, which could be a, a derailer. But, you know, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, it's very much okay to blow off steam after a tough day. Everybody's been there, but I feel as a leader, I kind of, you know, dust myself off, jump back in the fight. Uh, and, you know, I, I feel like that, that attitude is the way Edward Jones is att attacking our transformation because, you know, we're choosing to lead. We're choosing to make those difficult choices to make a difference in the world. And I think that's an enviable place to be. Yeah, it's a great expression you may, may think of, which is confused minds don't act. And you can really bog the organization down when you yeah. get uh, that that happens. And I'm not sure many people have ever been uh, 
said that they were over communicating, especially in our space. So that's great. Um, another great one of yours, uh, we are responsible for setting the conditions for success. So what, what's behind that? Yeah, this is about clarity and focus, right? You know, as a leader, my, my job is not only set the ambition for where we need to go and why, uh, but also, also create those conditions for success. Um, and this is everything from, are we working on the right priorities? Uh, are we appropriately funded, right? That's, that's huge, right? Um, how can I help remove those constraints uh, so that people can really focus on what they need to? Um, also create uh, communication mechanisms for feedback. Uh, but it, most importantly, it's about assembling the right team and getting out of their way, right? So most of the time, I'm actually not doing the work our very talented associates are. So my role really becomes setting them up for success, helping them in any way I can, and uh, you know, allow them to really create those outcomes that help with career growth for our associates, but also deliver more value to more people as quickly as possible. I see so many organizations that are almost, uh, they show up as victims, right? They're, they're, they're always playing defense. They're always on their back heels. And I love how you set people up to be leaning forward. And I've got so many more Frankisms, but one more I'd like to sneak in. Um, and you kind of mentioned it earlier in one of your answers, but we're going to raise the ceiling and the floor. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, you know, you know, every January, and it's January, right? I used to say, new year, time to raise the bar, and we need to make this best, the, the best year ever. And I actually really do mean that, because, I, you know, you want to set the tone for, for the year, and every year needs to be better than the, the last year. And in fact, my word for 2024 is better, uh, because even though I, I, I think we had a great 2023, uh, we always can improve. And, and that's our role, and that's my role to kind of challenge folks to do that. Um, but there are new opportunities to learn and grow. There are new challenges uh, and, I, and, and I thought about it, I said, yeah, we need to raise the bar, uh, which will help lift the lid on the organization. But actually, you know, I, I thought about it some more, you got to raise the floor as well, right? You just can't add on to the new without sort of fortifying the existing. And that, you know, when you talk about fortifying, it also includes abandoning and stopping things that are no longer fit for purpose. So, you know, if you continue to pour concrete into these legacy approach, approaches, it'll actually weigh you down and make raising the ceiling and the lid on the organization more difficult. So you really have to do both. So if you raise the floor each year, it actually forces you to reach higher. Uh, so in 2024, we're absolutely going to raise the floor and the ceiling. That's uh, so much going on right there. I, I love I love this stuff. You know, the best CIOs today build world class championship caliber teams. You love to win. You do that through your team. Um, let's listen to our next mystery question or to see how you were doing in this area, Frank. Well, when I think about Frank and leadership, I'm just in awe of multiple aspects. Two that stand out are, are his relentless focus on talent and how he sets a big ambition, but then breaks it down into small pieces to get it moving. So the, the first question for Frank is, Frank, you, you just don't hire world-class talent. You, you find world-class talent that also works together as a world-class championship team. So Frank, share how you approach building a team that isn't just all about all-stars, but a team that works together truly as a world-class team. Yeah, so that question is definitely from Andy, Andy Meadler, our CFO. And actually Andy and I are in lockstep when it comes to leading change and, and challenging our firm to be better. And what I love about Andy is his authentic, authenticity and honesty, right? He is always great at giving feedback and you always know where you stand. Um, but, you know, so, so when I, I think about our team, uh, you know, we're always seeking the best, most diverse talent and skills that we, that we can find. And we want people to not only be great at their craft, so, you know, but uh, it's really about more than just being an all-star. Uh, I, I really look for somebody who can play a role on the team that wants to be a member of a championship team. You know, a championship team plays together, wins together, uh, improves together and and they share success, but they're at complete stake for one another. Um, and when I think about being a member of a championship team, when I look for talent, um, I really want the person to be able to showcase their leadership impact, uh, really work on strengthening trust. You know, we talked about promises made, promises kept. That is absolutely key. Uh, someone who's going to challenge. So we want to challenge each other. We want to take risks together. Um, somebody who's actually focused on clear stakeholder outcomes. And it's just not about motion, right? And it's about true progress so that we can deliver outcomes that we can measure. But it's also about trade-offs, right? You want clarity on short-term choices and how they impact or align to more long-term strategic choices uh, and really value uh, a straight talk. Uh, say what you mean, mean what you say, don't beat around the bush, right? 
uh, and, and debate, like debate openly and professionally in the room and never walk past something, right? Uh, you know, pull others into the conversation. Uh, you know, I, I don't like idle bystanders, uh, nor do I like overly dominant voices, right? Uh, but I, I definitely subscribe to silence equals disagreement. Um, and you, because you kind of have to state what you will do and what you won't do. Uh, and most importantly, you know, I, I think I mentioned this before, so celebrate and enjoy the ride and have fun, right? We spend so much time together. You've got to be able to have fun with what you do. So, uh, you know, when you assemble those, those teams and the leadership uh, and they start to behave that way, it really deepens the trust amongst the, the team. Uh, it also builds firm confidence uh, because they, the firm knows we're going to show up ready. And I think it also compels us as a firm to be better uh, to help one another and most importantly, be at stake for our collective success. So, uh, you know, it, it definitely makes other teams take notice. Uh, it forces them to be better prepared. So, so getting those team dynamics right creates the conditions to, to as I mentioned before, we've kind of raise that floor, raise that ceiling. Uh, but I love my team and I'm not afraid to tell them that. I appreciate Andy highlighting that because every time you and I get together, Frank, you talk about this A team that you've, uh, that you've got here. And we have a second question from Andy that speaks to your gifts as a visionary leader. And so uh, Andy, let's, to, uh, let's tune up Andy for question number two. Frank, got another question for you. You, you have the ability to see a vision that isn't just one or two years ahead. It might be a decade or even longer ahead, but then you methodically break that work down, the work to be done and the investments to be made that's in a clear, logical way that not just brings others along, but has them see themselves in that future. And that creates buy-in for the investments and for that transformation. Frank, how do you balance seeing so far ahead, far ahead of what others and other colleagues may even see, but then have that ability to break it down in such a logical, step-by-step -step way that builds confidence to allocate the funds and bring a transformational journey to life? Yeah, I love that question, Brandy. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big thinker and I feel like it's my role to set that North Star, set that ambition for where we need to go. But I also love execution, right? So, so creating that vision is just part of the equation, right? I always say PowerPoint is undefeated, right? It's about the execution in the end. Um, uh, but the real work comes with uh, how you prioritize, how you sequence that roadmap. What is your execution strategy? Uh, and, and the the continuous momentum that you have to generate and sustain to really turn that vision in, into a reality. And, and I also know it's really hard work when you're in the now and there's so much going on to kind of look up and think about what the future looks like. You know, how do we transform and how do we lead and how do we compete in the future? Um, so the approach I take, you know, very much like the original narrative is, is, is to put together that vision, that narrative uh, that first and foremost lays out a challenge statement. And that challenge statement is actually a call to attention, a call to action. And what the challenge statement does is it really clearly states where we want to go, identify what's getting in the way, and then outlines what we're going to do about it. So when I think about that challenge statement, it, it includes this ideal future state. It really just starts to specify what, what's the valuable outcome we're seeking. And, you know, a, a, an example of one I've used before is, is, you know, we need to deliver integrated, well-adopted digital platforms and experiences and those capabilities need to make it easier to do business and make our branch teams proud. But from there, it also identifies the gaps in the current state um, and really defines that challenge or the primary constraint, uh, you know, basically what's getting in the way. An example of the primary constraint in, in this case is that legacy system complexity and the behavior that it re reinforces. Um, but the key with all that, when you're sort of stating, you know, where you need to go and, and you know, the, the problem statement, if you will, is that optimal path forward. Uh, and what it, that really means, what are you going to do about it, right? So that, that optimal path forward lays out the solution and the roadmap to get there, such as investing in the talent and the technology to accelerate in, innovation and help future-proof our firm. And really that our digital strategy recognizes that you have to augment that competitive advantage by, by realizing our ability to kind of reinvent with innovation, agility, and standard setting integration capabilities. Um, but it's just not that statement, right? So that statement is supported by assertions and proof points. And an example would be, you know, what I referenced before when we discussed the vertical transformation narrative, um, it's, you know, expectations have changed. So what are we gonna do about that? And, you know, consumers, as I mentioned, have advanced to so all these advanced technology features that were unimaginable, but now it's the expectations. So what are we going to do about that? What's the approach we're going to take? 
And so that really leads that to then the from and to's, right? Describing where we are today and where we need to go and what we need to look like tomorrow. So it's not just about um, automating existing processes. You know, we need to go to transforming digital business processes. And very much as, you know, used to be about delivery focused. Have I delivered something? And now it has to move towards delivering extraordinary experiences and to be adoption focused, right? Because delivery is not enough. Your outcomes need to be well adopted and they actually need to create that value. And so that challenge statement you know, is not stale, right? It goes through several rounds of iterations. Um, you socialize it, you get the feedback. And then as Angie talked about, you start to break that work down into those manageable chunks. Uh, you're focused on the investment and the resources required. What value are, gonna do, are you going to deliver? What is the timing of those? Um, and most importantly, how that change affects the home office associates, uh, our branch teams, our clients, and what do they need to do to adopt these new capabilities and what is their role in the transformation? So the plans are always living plans and we, we absolutely pivot based upon changes in, in firm priorities, changes in regu regulations, uh, but still with that eye on delivering the, the ultimate vision. So, uh, and of course, you know, those plans have to be anchored by measures and the objectives and what are your key results that you're gonna mark yourselves to. Um, but it really comes down to building that com uh, confidence, talked about promises made, promises kept, it always comes back to that. Uh, and delivering on the value and the outcomes that uh, the uh, in the investments that our firm makes. And what I love about being part of, of of private partnership is we're actually just beholden to ourselves, right? And our partnership and, uh, but in always in service to our branch teams and our clients. So with that advantage, we actually get to make the right decisions uh, that are only influenced uh, by what we want to achieve. And, uh, you know, at, at Edward Jones, we're continuously investing in our future, our technology, our digital experience, so that we can continue to po uh, partner for positive impact to make better lives of our clients, our colleagues, and the communities that we serve. You know, Frank, I think our, our audience is getting a good sense of how you can make big, bold promises and, and how you deliver them. So I really appreciate this. And Andy snuck in one more question I'll, I'll ask for him. It's a very serious question. He wanted me to ask, Mets or Yankees, Jets or Giants? Uh, so I think he knows a little about your, your sports <laughs> background. That one's easy. It's Yankees always, Mets <laughs> absolutely never. Uh, uh, boy, I think both need to do some soul searching these days. Uh, but also I say now that I live in St. Louis and I've been here for eight years, um, I've definitely adopted the, the Cardinals, right? They, they're, they too are a world-class organization such dedicated fan base and Bush Stadium is actually a perfect place to see a baseball game. Um, and as far as football, well, much to this man, my wife, I love football. Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Saturday, Good Friday. Um, uh, but I actually root for both the Giants and the Jets. Uh, but if they ever played a meaningful game against each other, it would be J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets for sure. But I can only hope for that. <laughs> That's good. Now, I, I, I knew the answer to the baseball question, and I was not going to tell you this in advance, but growing up in New England, we always rooted for the Red Sox and whoever was playing the Yankees. Yes. And I'm sure it was the same where, where you were too. It's in the reverse. Exactly. I have a t-shirt that says the opposite of that. So, yeah, that's good stuff. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I didn't want you to bail out this, this podcast, so I didn't tell you, tell you that first. So, you know, once in a while we get a really clever question that on the surface seems to be simple and easy, but that draws out an answer that's like, you know, like one of those wow answers. So I think this is one of those questions. So our fourth mystery question is pretty special. Uh, let's listen in. Frank, I know that you are a huge lover of, of music and some of the same music I know that my husband loves, uh, Avid Brothers being one of those bands. And, and Scott Avid has a great lyric that's decide what you want to be and go be it. So as you are, are leading yourself and the team and, and trying to keep people motivated, what's your favorite lyric that comes to mind that you use to help motivate individuals through that transformation? Uh, I love that question. And, and Kristen is, I think it's Kristen Johnson who uh, courageously leads our, our firm trans, uh, transformation as our chief transformation officer and her husband, PK, we, we're music lovers and concert go goers and uh, my wife, Deborah and I, you know, we're always comparing notes. Um, so I, I've used these two that I'm going to mention in the past because I have to uh, cho choose between the two, right? So the first is, is Crosby, Stills, Nash, and there's a song called Helplessly Hoping. And the chorus is that they are one person uh, they are two alone, they're three together, but they're for each other, but it's F-O-R, so for each other, kind of at stake for one another. And I always think about that when you're trying to bring an idea to, to life, right? You have One person may have an idea, they want to bounce it off of somebody else, 
uh, you know, it, but you're still thinking, is this the right way to go? Well, when you start to get three together, right, you got a movement, right? You got a, uh, you got a, some momentum that you're generating um, to try to make it real. And then when you start down that path, you need to be for each other, to be at stake for one another and each other's success. And that sort of completes the cycle. So I am sure CSN did not intend that with the song, but it actually r- rings true uh, and motivates me. Um, and the other one I always use is that it's a song by uh, Wilco, A Shot in the Arm. And Jeff Tweedy, who I love, is really emphatic at the end of the song where he, what he, sa- he says, what you once were isn't what you want to be anymore. And he says it over and over again. And I think that's really that emphatic moment where you, in, it really signals that you realize you have to lead through this change jersey journey to be who you want to be. Uh, and so very much in line with the Avid brothers, decide what you want to be and go be it. But um, I can answer all those questions like that all day long. So I really like that question. <laughs> You've got a pretty wide range of music uh, uh, there. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much. And uh, she actually has another brilliant question. So let's tee that up for Frank. Frank, you've been so done such a great job leading through a lot of foundational infrastructure change that that we've needed at the organization to provide the, the tools that our branch teams are receiving today. I know you also have been putting things in place to anticipate where we may run into issues. Can you share a little bit more around what those proactive efforts have been to anticipate challenges we may run into? Yeah, the, now the, the hard question, right? So, it, but a really important question, and, and every technologist deals with this, right? Every day, stability, security, scale on a daily basis, it's job one, right? Uh, you don't get any high fives for having a good day, right? Because that's the expectation each and every day, right? But when you run into problems, we know it's disruptive to, to our branch teams, to the client experience, and it actually detracts from the value we're, we're seeking to provide. Uh, but I will tell you, during a transformation, you don't make any progress if you're not breaking some eggs along the way. So you really need to be fearless and have the strong conviction that the work you're doing is the right work in order to future-proof our opportunity. Um, and I leave with that conviction every day, uh, you know, especially since we transformed a, lar- a largely mainframe-driven legacy infrastructure to a cloud-first modern paradigm. And uh, we've, we've uh, applied enhanced monitoring, uh, telemetry, uh, we've got a first-rate production services organization and inc- uh, incident management team that address little things before they become more widespread. Uh, and then, you know, after the fact, have a really detailed root cause analysis, always leading to lessons learned and the appropriate change. So, but it's also not just about disassembling the legacy because we're trying to build that future state and build quality into the design of the new platforms. Uh, so out of the gate, ensuring automated testing, um, the approach we take also is to deliver what I call a minimal viable product, right? To pilot users, and they help us test and learn along the way so that we can adjust uh, as we need to in an agile fashion and then ultimately scale that solution. So the question actually ties nicely to the one that Kevin Adams had because you need to be calm on the mic, you need to be transparent, um, but you, you really have to take aggressive action to remediate and learn and, and do better the next day. And since we talked about music, I'll, I'll quote Eric Church, right? You can't be bad at the sun for coming up again, right? You just need, and when things go wrong, you need to dust yourself off, re, uh, you know, be ready for it, attack the new day. And uh, it's just a great opportunity to make the world a better place. Awesome. Well, Kristen, Andy, Kevin, Bob, thanks for those great questions. They were very busy people, but they were very enthusiastic to be part of this and to, to honor you with those questions. So thank, thank you for that. that. And my first introduction to you and Kristen, actually, I remember it very vividly. It was a few years ago. I was uh, working with Lisa Nichols. We were launching the Tech LX Leadership Program here yeah. in St. Louis. And I think it took you and Kristen all of five minutes to say, we're in. Let's, uh, what, what do we do? How do we sign up? And uh, I think it just speaks to uh, the proof of the pudding of how much you really care about your equipping your people to go be successful. Yeah, I'd say, you know, first and foremost, uh, the, the program is absolutely fantac- fantastic. Um, we've sent about 20 emerging leaders through it uh, over the last few years. We actually have a, a, the next class of four teed up. Um, I've also served as a mentor, which was actually probably more rewarding for me than the person I was mentoring. Uh, but it really is an amazing program. And you both have uh, d- just let your leadership light shine here because of the impact you're making on the leaders of the future. Future, And I know our associates love it as well. Uh, and I always subscribe to the fact that leaders aren't born, they're made through hard work and experience. And that Tech LX Leadership Development Program really provides that platform and opportunity to make better leaders, not only for Edward Jones, but you know the wider St. Louis community, which is important to, to us here at Edward Jones as well. And so thank you, to, you know, Dan, to you and Lisa for your leadership. 
Well, I appreciate that, Frank. And, you know, going take, taking one of your terms, uh, we really want to work on that magic middle, really help that magic middle because they've got hard jobs and help them be successful going forward. And, you know, one of the fun things we do in this, uh, in the podcast and Edward Jones does so much, what, 3,000 communities that you are operating in. You do a lot of those communities. You know, we're trying to do a, a part two in terms of giving scholarships to our TechLX program, $150,000 a year. And what we do on the show here is we give you the ability to gift a seat uh, in that program to one of the nonprofits that you support. So anybody come to mind, Frank? Well, first, you know, thank you, Dan. Uh, but you know, we work with so many organizations that uh, are helping us drive greater financial futures or financial strength in our communities. Um, and we have deep relationships with these organizations. So I will definitely work with our community impact team and come back to you with a name. But I said, you know, Thank you so much for allowing us to, to share this incredible opportunity locally here, locally here in St. Louis. Um, it really was such a great experience. And I think it actually very much ties into the work that we're doing with, with Access Point. Um, you know, here in St. Louis, we partner with uh, Ron Darty, who's the CEO of Darty Systems, to create a, a program called Access Point. Uh, and it really is an amazing idea that is making such a great impact on the lives of disadvantaged youth here in St. Louis by providing access to education and mentorship and support for high school students who want a, a technology career. And so we work together with local school districts and provide opportunities to become a technology apprentice to these, these high school graduates. In fact, we, we kicked off our second cohort a few weeks ago. Uh, the apprentices, they work on real work, real, you know, real projects. Uh, and if they're successful, actually get offered a full-time job the following year. So our first cohort in 23, uh, 2023 was fantastic. And our second cohort looks equal to the task as well. And the program is much broader than Edward Jones now. And it's across all of St. Louis, not only provides opportunities for, for a tech career, but more importantly, a better life, right? So many of these students can't afford college. Uh, maybe they have to take care of their family first but it gives them you know, hope, it gives them great life and technical skills uh, and the opportunity to earn a quality of living. And, and it also doesn't preclude them from going to college, it just becomes a choice. Uh, so we're two years in and I believe we have positively impacted the lives of these students who are now, some of them are actually Edward Jones Associates now, uh, and it really amplifies our purpose to partner for positive impact to better the lives of the communities that we serve. So I'd say all credit goes to, to Ron Darty, his team, uh, our Edward Jones Access Point cohort team, uh, the mentors, uh, and everyone who provided that extraordinary leadership here in, in in St. Louis. And I know Ron has designs on making a national program. So, you know, um, you know, thank you, Dan, for <laughs> your, your gracious gift. Uh, but, you know, to Ron and the Edward Jones team for for the leadership and the impact that they show every day. That's outstanding. Yeah, great job, Ron. And, you know, your your national enthusiasm comes out, Frank, when you talk about these things. I, I, I love it. Um, we cover a lot of territory. Um, yeah, they're going to put a wrap on the podcast, uh, but fortunately, you and I are going to continue on, and we're going to post a blog next week on CI.com. And uh, I'm very curious, you've spent time, you talked about the white paper you wrote five years ago. You've also got a very well thought out, well crafted and well communicated set of leadership principles, and really becomes the North Star. So I want to unpack that with you. But you know, for the podcast, I want to give you the last word today. But first, Dan, I want to say thank you for allowing me to tell our Edward Jones story. Uh, I hope this gives folks listening who may be thinking about joining our firm uh, a bit of insight into what we're all about. And if you're thinking about becoming a client, know that we're deeply committed to helping you achieve your goals and dreams. Um, I always say three things about Edward Jones, and I, I'm proud to be a partner here, joined eight years ago. Uh, but first and foremost, Edward Jones is absolutely the best firm that I've ever worked for. Uh, we're a purpose-driven firm. Uh, making a real difference in the lives of our clients, uh, colleagues, our associates, and the communities that we serve. Uh, second, our associates and leaders are the best and most talented people I've ever worked with. Uh, I see this every day uh, with the work that we do together, uh, and it's all focused on delivering the, that extraordinary experience to our branch teams and, and our clients. But I also want to say thank you. Thank you to our associates who help drive that, that vertical transformation of the first five years of the journey. And your reward for that is the next five years, which is our a five-year digital roadmap. But I can't say thank you enough for your commitment, uh, your sacrifice, and the things that you do to make uh, Edward Jones just the best place on earth to work. Uh, and finally, I don't have many career regrets, but I always say I wish I would have gotten Edward Jones much sooner. Uh, becoming a, a partner here, 
uh, has made me a better leader, has made me a better human. And I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to you know, learn something new every day, give something back. Uh, so Dan, thank you for the opportunity to talk about our strategy, uh, the impact that we seek to make here at Edward Jones. And again, you know, one last thank you to our associates who've been on this journey all throughout. Uh, you know, thank you so much. And uh, let's get ready to rock and roll for the next five years. That's an amazing bow uh, around the podcast. I, you know, those three points, I just took some notes. I mean, what a formula for success, Frank. Best company, best people, best service, best leader, best human. So I'm excited to see what the next promises made are, are going to be. And uh, I know you're going to keep them because yeah. I know the formula awesome. now. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Appreciate Great it. Great job. We'll see you all next time, everybody. Thanks so much.